Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. Bart's in Midtown Manhattan. My name is Meredith Ward, and I'm on the clergy team here at St. Bart's. And on behalf of all of us, it is my joy to welcome you to the forum where each Sunday we have sacred conversations about the things that matter. This morning, we are delighted to welcome two palliative care chaplains for a conversation on surfacing hope at the end of life. The Reverend Molly O'Neill Frank is staff palliative care chaplain at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. She's also a priest in the Episcopal Church and serves here at St. Bart's as well as at Grace Church Millbrook. And Chaplain Stephen Douglas is a pediatric palliative care chaplain at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And before that, he taught creative writing at Brooklyn College. Molly and Stephen, welcome. We're so glad you're here for this really important conversation. Thank you. So before we get started, can you, as we get started, can you just tell us a little bit about how each of you became interested in the field of palliative care chaplaincy? Sure. First of all, thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to chat about this, um, the work we do. Um, for me, I think, you know, like everybody here sitting in the room, life is understood, what is it Kierkegaard said, uh, in, in retrospect. Um, I mean, I think my sort of journey to um, chaplaincy, hospital chaplaincy, was one that was probably informed by uh, a deep sort of need to address the question of, 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 of what's the secret? Like, what do we, what, what, what is, the, what is the, um, the existential secret to, to faith? And, and why is it that we have this, um, this, this enormous body of scripture and midrash and, and um, scholarly, uh, work that addresses this question of, of what happens when we die. And I've always been interested in this question, maybe a little morbidly, but ever since I was young. Um, and it took a lot of life to get me to a place where I actually understood that the secret was probably not embedded in my brain, but was probably someplace in my heart that was not, not, not explainable. Um, which really drew me um, some some life some life uh, events um, for me uh, certainly some uh, pretty major illnesses some hospital stays um, complicated pregnancies uh, and the death of my mother who had had cancer for over a quarter of her life um, and uh, being with her at the very end of her life which was a, a transformational event um, I think many people have had that experience, uh, led me to a place where I realized that I needed to be with, with, I needed to be in that space. That was that liminal space between here and between, between not presently in our mortal bodies. That was a space that I had to be a part of. So that's what led me to begin my work um, in seminary. How about you? Yeah, I agree that, um it really is one of those things that kind of makes sense only in retrospect. For myself, um, chaplaincy is not what I planned to go into. I planned to stick with academics. Uh, and I fell in love with it in my little one unit of CPE that I did, which is the kind of training chaplains do. And then in pediatrics, that also wasn't something I was seeking out. I um, it was the first day of my chaplain residency and training, and they asked my co-residents, they said, well, one of the assignments is to cover all of inpatient pediatrics. Who would like to do that? And my co-residents were like, so I said, okay, I'll do it. And then palliative care also wasn't what I sought out, but very quickly I identified for myself um, that work in palliative care, work with a really small team of people who were uh, guided to the same goal is what would make this work sustainable for me. And only in retrospect does the pediatric thing make sense. My mom taught um, preschool age special needs for her entire career. And only in retrospect does the palliative care piece uh, really make sense for me. I think I'm somebody who always, my default personality is 
really drawn to the kind of peaks and valleys of life. And it just struck me as any kind of chaplaincy, just such a profound gift and privilege to be welcomed into other people's lives at some of the most pivotal and often some of the hardest moments of their life. And then, I think for myself anyway, only more so with children and young people, that um, many of the habits of speech, the things that we as adults are trained into, for instance, at a coffee hour here, could ask probably most of the people in this room, and you could ask me, how are you doing today? And my answer would be good. Well, fine, thanks for asking. If I were to say, well, I'm actually having a really hard day, I, uh, my mom is kind of, you'd be like, whoa, 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 I just, <laughs> that's not the social contract here. I, you say, fine, and I, then I go on my way. And what I love about kids, and especially kids who've been through some really hard stuff, is they'll get right at the truth. And to me, there is tremendous grace in that. And being able to walk alongside people going through the kind of things that most of us spend our whole lives not only not talking about, but actively avoiding even thinking about um, is a profound, profound gift. That's beautifully said, both of you. Thank you so much, because it's a, it's a very personal call, right, to this, this kind of work. So what exactly is a chaplain? <laughs> when I did my CPE training, I would walk into people's hospital rooms and they would be like, what are you doing here? So what, what exactly is a chaplain? What do you well, I'll, I'll start, Steve, just jump in. Uh, you know, chaplain is one of those squishy words um, that you know, brings to mind all kinds of things. I, I do some teaching at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering of fellows and of uh, new, newly onboarded advanced practitioners. Um, and part of the slideshow that we do is what is a chaplain? And there's Charlie Chaplin, there's Mother Teresa, there's MASH, there's, you know, there's a million different iterations of the chaplain. And, you know, the chaplain in, in history, uh, you know, had certain connotations and we can talk about that. But a 21st century chaplaincy is, at least in big cities, um, you know, where there are hospitals that, that have, a, have a very varying population, there are criteria that you have to meet to be considered a hospital chaplain. And many people don't really realize that there's quite a bit of training. When people say, wait, it feels like you've been doing like seminary and like chaplains and like priests like forever. And it's like, well, because I trained through seminary and through four units of what's called clinical pastoral education, CPE, and they're each 400 hour units, and they require m much reflection and didactic and patient work and uh, supervisory work and group work, and you're writing a lot. Um, and then you go up in front of a board of people who are a part of the Association for Professional Chaplains and they evaluate your work. It's sort of like presenting a dissertation and you present them with all of these things that you've been working on and all your co competencies. Um, you know, to become board certified is a 3,000 hour effort after graduate school. And if you are in a New York City hospital or a Boston or, or you know, Chicago or a big city hospital, likely is UCBCC after a chaplain's name tag. They are board certified by the uh, Association for Professional Chaplains. Um, and that means that we are all trained to meet patients where they are, not, not meeting them from our perspective as, as clergy or as particular denominational perspective, but I see Muslim patients and Jewish patients, I see atheist patients, I see agnostic patients, increasingly uh, unaffiliated uh, patients with any kind of denomination. So, so we are trained to be with them to try to surface what their spiritual reservoirs are. What is their, what, what gives them light in, in their eyes when you're talking to them that we can begin to surface as something that might actually be uh, able to surface meaning for a patient at the end of their life. Um, and we travel with them in that space. 
I'll stop there. Peter, you might um, have something to add, Steve. Yeah, I think I'll pick up with that travel idea. I think of myself as gentle accompaniment. And I think for that particular that you mentioned of CPE, and I had the same experience of training to be a chaplain, of like, what the heck is this job? And what is my role in it? And for many of the young you know, families that I meet, where it's teens and adolescents I work with, the millennial parents, many of them have no idea what a chaplain is when I walk into that room. And I find that really a grace and a gift. And I think the, the wider institutions, we have uh, a lot of training and formalization, as Molly mentioned. But I think in some ways we're illegible to a certain degree to the institution itself, which actually gives us a tremendous amount of room. I, I think of myself as having the liberty to just stay with like a radical fidelity to the patient because I don't have to worry about getting them out the door and discharge and money and dollars and things like that. I don't have to worry about whether this surgery is best gonna be done at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia or at New York Presbyterian. I just get to be there with the family in whatever way is meaningful for them. So I think of it along the lines of each of us has a sense of identity, a sense of self, and stories that we tell. Some of those are explicit. They're what I tell you when I meet you, like who I am, where I live, what kind of work I do. Some of them are implicit, things that I wouldn't necessarily even know are some of my stories about myself. Serious illness um, and the face of the, the possibility of death have a tremendous capacity long chronic illness, hospitalization, all of these things to sever ourselves from the stories we've been telling, right? So I'll meet a teen who says, I'm a runner and I'm an artist and now I can't even get out of bed and I don't have the strength to move my hand. Who am I, right? So for part of me, I think my fidelity to those stories and to that inner spirituality and sense of self that has brought someone all of this way to the point of me meeting them is for me just gentle accompaniment to sometimes help them remember their own strengths, their own resources, the own things that have got them to this point. And then in the cases where those stories aren't working anymore, I can be something of a gentle guide into finding a new story that does work. Beautiful. Um, Molly, you mentioned how the work how how the work of chaplaincy has evolved over time how and it sounds like it's evolved quite a bit how is it how is the work that that you two do different from a chaplain from 50 years ago for example yeah i mean i think i mean i i wonder if there was a pediatric palliative care chaplain 50 years ago you know and i i think that there probably wasn't. Um, I think the chaplains 50 years ago often walked in the room with a certain, there was a more re religious aspect to the um, encounter. Um, and there can be. I mean, one of the things that I say to my patients when I meet them is, as I come in the room, I'm the only person who doesn't have to do anything to you. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I'm sure you walk into a child's room when you have your hands behind your back, practically, you know, they're very, you know, but I, I, I including wake you up. Um, I, I, that's bad spiritual care. Waking, I'm gonna take my earring off because it's, it's clicking against this mic. Um, excuse me while I do that. Um, I think, I think that, that, that 50 years ago, uh, first of all, I think that there was, you know, a sense of, of a sacramental role that a chaplain played in a room that, although it is, is still absolutely there, it has become increasingly a, a piece, a slice of the bigger pie that we uh, provide. As, as spiritual caregivers. And also the nomenclature of the Department of Pastoral Care has, sh has changed. That is, that is no longer, that has a Judeo-Christian um, feel to it. And uh, we are now the Department of Spiritual Care and Education at, 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 um, at New York Presbyterian and MSK. So um, spiritual care, you know, is a, 
a piece of, of, of how patients, people don't come to a hospital to have a religious experience, okay? They don't. And, and we, we, <laughs> we know our place. <laughs> But there isn't a person who comes to a hospital who does not have a spiritual encounter or a spiritual experience or can say that they have had been transformed in some way by their experience in the hospital for good or for bad. And so if, 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 we, don't, if we don't have people there, chaplains there, to, to work with that spiritual engagement with whatever it is they are going through, then the whole hospitalization, like what's the point? Because everybody would just be like, I'm out. The spirit is the thing that's animating the engagement with whatever it is that is going to get them through the hospitalization or whatever it is that's going to get them into a place of peace if they are dying. And so the role is, sure, there are sacramental pieces to it, but it is a much more encompassing um, encounter. And I would say that our patients are increasingly not religious. And nevertheless, you know, absolutely need chaplaincy. Um, I'm sure you have more to add to that as well. Yeah, I think just in brief, it's, you know, in part, I'd say 50 years ago, the role of chaplain as a professional role um, in, a, in healthcare, you know, chaplaincy certainly existed in other contexts, military, police. Um, firefighters, places like that. But as chaplain, as a professional role as opposed to a volunteer role, a role usually served by your community clergy member that would come and visit you in the hospital when you're sick. Uh, 50 years ago, the role of uh, professional chaplain was just beginning to form. And so my role, uh, my role like Molly, I'm a, my functional role is I'm a multi-faith chaplain, which just means I'm there for everyone. But we work alongside priests and rabbis and imams and people who are devoted to a particular patient population there. Um, and I think that last piece of what you said, Molly, really gets to something important. Like I perform religious rituals, I perform baptisms of infants, and for many families, they would never define themselves not only as religious or even they wouldn't feel comfortable saying I, I consider myself a spiritual person. And it's Often those patients who, among my cohort, you know, millennial parents and younger people, it's often those people who most benefit from a chaplain visit because they may not have a local faith community who's coming and visiting them yeah. and yeah. offering them support and meaning making in that way. And so my role, um, especially for the families who don't have their local rabbi, their local priest, coming to hold their hand or talk to them while they're going through a surgery or whatever they're going through is really um, one of the places I think chaplains are most vital. Uh, and I'd say that's probably a major difference from where the field was 50 years ago. Yeah. So I want to get into that uh, multi-faith, no faith, spiritual uh, landscape that you're working in and the kind of training that's involved in a second. But before we go there, you are both palliative care chaplains. What's the difference between palliative care and hospice care? <laughs> well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll start. I mean, first of all, I think hospice gets a, just a terrible branding problem, uh, honestly. I mean, hospice, it's a, it's a, it's a service. It's, a, it's, it's the nomenclature for a, a suite of, of services that are offered by insurance. Um, palliative care, and we can talk about that, palliative care in a hospital, you can be having, at MSK, you can be still having interventions and curative interventions and, and, be, on, and be on what we don't say palliative anymore, we say supportive care. Uh, because palliative care also was getting a little bit um, for patients. So supportive care is basically a service. We are a consulting service that is called by the primary team or by the patient themselves for an extra layer of psychosocial and pain support. So it is also a bit of a suite of services that are offered within the palliative care or supportive care division that look at the entire picture. And at MSK, supportive care often is called in to take a look at the 50,000 foot 
perspective of what's been happening with a patient that's had a lot of different services working on their cancer care. Um, and the patient is often overwhelmed with a lot of different uh, doctors and a lot of different opinions and a lot of different um, choices. Sometimes supportive care comes in and says, oh, let's take a look at the whole picture here. Let's take a look at the whole patient and what's happening with their pain and what's happening with their despair and what's happening with the psychosocial needs that they may be having that have more to have, have something else to do with what's happening besides the, the physiological and the biology of the cancer. Yeah, um, so to start with kind of the technical piece, and then I'll kind of spread out from there. So hospice is basically, it just means it is a suite of services offered for anyone who a group of doctors would not be surprised, basically, if that person did in fact pass within six months. It doesn't mean that they will. There's many people who are in hospice for years. There's many people who graduate out of hospice. And people who are enrolled in hospice tend to live longer than people who are not enrolled in hospice. There are have, white papers on that, everybody. Have a similar um, diagnosis. Yep. And palliative care is um, an expansion of the hospice philosophy to anybody facing chronic, serious, or life-altering illness. Hospice really is a philosophy at its core more than it is a suite of services. Cicely Saunders, one of the doctors who really founded the modern hospice movement, has this beautiful quote that I just heard my spouse quote, who is a palliative care doctor. Who I work um, with at Sloan Kettering. Yeah. Um, saying that a patient was asked what a good doctor does. And the response was that they try to see me, to really see who I am. And so two pieces, that piece of being seen for who you are. What, what's important to you? What are your hopes? What are your values? What are your goals? And then that piece about trying, the work that goes into that. In pediatrics, hospice is available with concurrent care, meaning you could still get all disease-directed therapy to help cure you and make you feel better, and you could be enrolled in hospice. Palliative care, as I said, it has no limit to who really might qualify that, except for what's determined institution to institution. It's also a philosophy of care, and both of them really at their core are saying, whether or not cure is possible, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, that healing in the broadest sense of the word, in the sense of the word that draws us to a place like this, to receive the Eucharist, to be part of a community, to show ourselves as we are, to be seen and to see others, to share our pain, to share our joy. In that sense, healing can be possible, whether or not the cure that we all might hope or pray for is. The difference between cure and healing, really important point, Stephen. Thank you for bringing that up. And being seen. So let's go back to this question of um, the multi-phase, no-phase, spiritual but not religious landscape uh, uh, that, you're, that you're working in. What kind of training do you get to be able to speak to this diversity of patients that you're, that you're encountering. Well, did you train with Michal? No, I train after. Okay. So uh, Stephen and I probably have some overlapping, some similarities here. Um, the training is, is, is fairly prescriptive. In other words, there is standardization. And maybe because chaplaincy is a soft art, there's a certain defensiveness. <laughs> That, that, and it goes above and beyond, I think, sometimes the, the training that you would get someplace else. I mean, spiritual injury is awful. And, and, and going into a room and, and being spiritually injurious is an anathema. It's awful. And so we are, the, the, uh, on, the, on the first level, it's like, that is, that is first and foremost, 
not what we're doing. We are not proselytizing. We are not talking about our own particular faith insofar as it is something that is better than, or might, you might try it, or something like that. There is no, that, that is not what we're up to in any way. So um, a lot of what the training can be is, what is it in you, in, uh, in me, in Steve, Meredith, in you, what do you, when you are feeling most desperate to do something for someone, what do you jump to? Um, for me, I'm a mother, so I just want to climb into bed with the patient and just put my arm around them and uh, tell them it's going to be okay. Um, my training is also, I also fix things, I solve things, I, I do stuff. My training had to do with recognizing my own go-to tendencies and dismantling that desire to fix or solve with a patient. Fixing and solving is not what we're doing because that's, that, that, that jump starts, that, over, that, that overrides the patient's journey. Um, the training is also, it's, it's, it is prescriptive. The, the people who train us are ACPE supervisors. They are trained themselves. We look at LGBTQ patient populations. We have geriatric, palliative, pediatric, um, uh, cancer populations, populations uh, with special needs. We look at we have didactics from experts in these areas. You know, we write up our patient encounters that are called verbatims. The verbatims are word-for-word -word conversations. Those are read in a group. The group then critiques. We meet with supervisors. We look at what we did, what we didn't do, where we got it all wrong. We dismantle that. We try it again. I mean, this is just, it's, it's a process of education. And it takes years, actually. And so what you're bringing into the room eventually is a, an awareness of yourself in the room, a third eye, and, and you, you begin to see yourself in that room. And if there's counter-transference happening, you are aware of what's happening in that room. And so you're not overloading it or getting too, too invested in something that you can't fix. I'll give you an example. One of my um, colleagues who I went through training with was a... Um, NICU nurse, she was a nurse practitioner for 30 years at New York Presbyterian. And she really struggled. She was a Catholic uh, sister as well, that's what she, she was, and she, was, she became a, a chaplain. Um, but that nurse part of her, you know, going into a room and not looking at all the buttons and the things and sort of taking a look at a chart, took a long time for her to sort of stop doing that. That wasn't her job in the room anymore. Um, I'll stop there, there's more, but I'll give Steve a chance to. Yeah, there's, um, there's a lot of training in cultural competency and in helping skills. So a skill that might help the listener feel heard, a skill that might help the listener reach an insight about what they're going through, skills that might be designed to help a listener kind of challenge um, something that's not working for them anymore. And all of those skills are important, but the cultural competency and the helping skills are nothing without this piece that you're talking about, Molly, which is the cultural humility to let the other person be another to, who exceeds anything you could imagine about what's going on in them and really approaching them with that fresh set of eyes. Um, and similarly, all of the competency in helping in what I might say and what I might not say that wouldn't be helpful is really secondary to this piece of that awareness of yourself. So the verbatim, when we render every single thing we said in a patient encounter as best we can and everything the patient said, I think fundamentally the most important part is we're asked to render how we were feeling in that moment, what our intention was for saying that, and what the effect was. So really that sense of what am I bringing to this encounter, that there is no objectivity. I'm never seeing anything with 
God's eye. I'm seeing it filtered through the lens of everything I've gone through, all of the hurts and hopes and pains that I bring with me, my experience of illness and hospitalization, my experience with my family, how I fit in, how I didn't fit into my family, all of those things are coming with me. And so it's really a lens to both a precautionary principle and just the knowledge that this is the document I'm working out of myself and to be aware of what's going on so that I don't say or do something that's really about me and not about the patient. Right. Yeah. Many of us think and if we've been through the death of a loved one or we think about our own death, hopefully in the very distant future, um, we, we have certain ideas about how we want to die, uh, where we want to die, what we want our own death to look like. Many people say they want to die at home, but a lot of people die in the hospital. And many people say they want um, what is called a good death. What, can you talk about both of those things maybe simultaneously? Why do people end up dying in the hospital? And what, what are characteristics of a so-called good death? Mm. That's a huge question. Um, I'll, I'll take a little stab and then jump in. Um, you know, people after the, after, uh, the war, um, <clears throat> the Great War probably, people were not you know, uh, dying at home as much. People, and certainly after World War II, uh, the medicalization of death became a much more um, uh, reasonable way to live out uh, your illnesses. Um, the idea of people dying at home, the whole, uh, the ritualization of, a sh of shiva or of a wake or of any of the things that we would lay a body out and the familiarity of being with a body um, and the sort of the, um, the ceremonies and the, and the witness to that uh, at home really was sort of, uh, be was, was, became an anachronism as, as hospitals became more and more sophisticated to keeping people alive. Um, and, and we've lost familiarity with it. And, um, and, and so hospitals are, you know, they, 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 are, they are complex entities, as the doctors in, in here know. And our ability, I'll speak for Sloan Kettering, in keeping people alive is pretty impressive. And so there are a lot of decisions at the end of life. And we all, if we're well and we think about how we want to die, when I think about how I want to die, I used to, I used to, I, I used to have such clarity. <laughs> Since I was young, <laughs> about how I wanted to die. Like, not this, not that, not that, not that. Clear. How come everybody doesn't want to have, you know, a, a good death that's not in a hospital, that's surrounded by their family, that's, you know, doesn't hurt, that's all clean, it's nice. Uh, well, you know, it's complicated, and it gets, there are a million decisions at the end of life that begin to happen in a way that you can't predict. And we don't do a great job, I think, uh, educating people on the myriad, the tree of decisions that, that can come up. You know, I have a friend who's like, I want a DNR, DNI tattooed to my chest <laughs> so that there's real clarity about it. And, you know, sometimes I've seen people who have been intubated and have been extubated and have lived, gone on to live. It's not always easy and it's not always clear. And I think that being humble as a chaplain and seeing that there are families who are in a diaspora across the world who need to come together to make decisions or who need to see somebody before they die. I mean, there are real considerations to be made. And also, being in a hospital and being in this sort of chaplain role, we hear about miracles, we talk about miracles, the miracle business is alive and well in hospitals for sure, and in fact it is, because in fact increasingly there are cases where a patient actually will have more life when the entire team thought it wasn't possible, which can be wonderful, is wonderful, and it's complicating as well for the narrative. Yeah, we live 
in a death-loving culture in the respect that we bear witness to death in our media almost incessantly, our fiction, uh, the 24-hour news cycle. And then we also live in an incredibly death-phobic society, a society that invites us at every moment to not think about the mortality of ourselves and our loved ones. And I just want to take a moment to say that in any room this big, someone, statistically someone in this room is going through something really hard right now with someone they love, and I just want to name that. Yep. Um, so in a society where we've really lost an explicit conversation about what would make a good death, we are left alone to think about what that means for ourselves very often. And most of the time, and I speak for myself too, even though this is my job, I don't want to think about that either. So what a good palliative care team hopefully can do for anyone who's in the hospital is help you and your family give voice to what is most important to you, to what a good life means, for however long we have, hopefully years and years and years, and also what a good death means. Working in pediatrics, that is a paradox, because most of us would say there is no good pediatric death. It's wrong, it's unjust, and if that's not our view that it's unjust, it's just unnatural, and that to a certain extent is true, and to a certain extent it's not. It is natural. It's part of human history from the yeah longest we, from the very beginning that we've been around. Um, so the notion of what a good death might be. We are presented with media about hospital dramas, right? Where all sorts of miracles happen. Miracles do happen, as Molly said, medical miracles. We also live in a very strange moment where we have a tremendous amount of medical technology that's excellent at keeping the body going, the lungs breathing, and the heart beating. We even have machines that will replace the work of your lungs and your heart. Unfortunately, we also are in kind of a surreal moment where there's almost nothing more beyond that that we can do. We cannot heal a brain. We cannot force lungs or hearts to heal. We can give them time. We can give them medicine. But there's a real limit to what can be done in those spaces. So if you're able to give voice in an even like large abstract or concrete sense about what a good life means to you, your team can help guide you for what those next choices make. Because the reality is that people who work in healthcare, who bear witness to healthcare, generally make very different um, goals of care decisions than people who don't. And so I think everybody deserves have an open set of eyes into what these different interventions that a hospital might offer are. And absolutely, every single person deserves the opportunity to speak for themselves about what's most important to them. Um, teams in the hospital can do that. But it's also something that's really helpful for individuals to think about beforehand, to write down to tell family members and friends in the advent that you can't speak for yourself. Um, I know it's conversations, speaking personally again, that I'd love to put off over, over and over, over and over, over again. But, but it really, it's a gift to give the people you love your own voice about what would mean most to you in these moments. I, I will just say that there is something called, um, I moderate something called death over dinner. I know, I'm not sure, <laughs> <little> but <laughs> it's Sloan Kettering does a whole series of death over dinner, uh, dinners actually, they give, they give you dinner. And it's, it's for the, it's been happening across the world actually. They've started, you know, I don't know, Ago or so, and MSK has got a uh, someone who is very interested in making sure these occur for all clinical, all staff, all staff, not just clinical, but all staff, uh, support staff. Um, and we're invited to come into a room, and we're eight people at a table, and there's a moderator, and we discuss all of those things: what we would like, you know, how we would like, what what we think about, how how do we sort of perceive what what happens, all of these things to get the conversation going. But I also have to say this, which is that goals of care conversations are 
conversations that patients and their families have all along a trajectory of an illness, um, sometimes they change. Sometimes the goals of a patient change. And just because you think you know, a pa you know what a patient wants when they come in, you know, sometimes that can shift. And that, that also can be tricky and complicating. Um, but as Steve said, I think thinking about how somebody is and wants to be in life um, is great information as they think about how they want to die. So I want to take uh, time to invite some questions from our audience. Uh, if you're here in the room, uh, Suzanne Vorster is here with uh, cards and pencils, and you can raise your hand. She'll bring you a card, and you can jot down your, your question, and she'll bring it to me. If you're joining us online, you can put your question in the comment or in the chat, or you can email me at mward at stbarts.org. Uh, we, we have not a ton of time left, but uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, you were talking about end-of-life challenges and decisions. What are some end-of-life opportunities for individuals and, and families? Well, of course, I think the big opportunity that I... I I, what, what breaks my heart when I'm in the hospital is seeing the miracle a little bit of somebody actually getting a little bit more life, um, which is sometimes out of, out of a situation that looks pretty hopeless. Suddenly they are there. And then seeing the family dynamic that has been complicated before, and the prayer that there would be a miracle that is the miracle that is occurring with somebody who might be extubated and might be talking or somebody who might open their eyes and, and to see that the, the family is still arguing over, <laughs> over things. Um, I, I, I think the opportunity to say what you want to say and to love in the fullest way and to see this person in, in their fullest sense is always an opportunity. And, and there's an opportunity, I think, certainly to reconcile. I think there's opportunity, of course, to forgive. Um, and there is opportunity for legacy work, and so I think one of the things that Steve might talk about is I, I, I see a lot of young patients at, at MSK as well, people in their 50s, 40s, 60s, um, you know, some of them with young children. And I, I work with these patients if they're ready to, to think about legacy work f for their families. Um, and that, that can take many, many forms. Um, that is an opportunity to to leave a voice um, behind as well. Yeah, I'd say there are as many ways to talk about a good death as there are people, because it's intensely personal. I've had mothers say to me, everyone here at the hospital keeps telling me that a good mother doesn't let her child suffer. But I'd say to you, a good mother never gives up on her child. And that's the story that that mother won't be living with for the rest of her life. So it's our job to empower that to take course. Um, at the, when things are truly near the end of life, part of what my team is responsible for is opening any doors we can to make meaning happen. I've had families say, we're, we just love Christmas, and we're so sad that we're never going to get to celebrate a Christmas with our baby. And we've turned that entire room into Christmas. Full Christmas tree, train set, presents. For some families, it's just being able to take all those tubes and wires off and just hold their baby one time. For others, it's just an acknowledgment of what, in my mind, is already true. I, I attend many perinatal losses. and. 
the number one things that are on parents' minds most frequently are, is my child somewhere good? And do they know how loved they are and how much I wanted them? Mm. And it's my job to assure them of that fact, whether we share the same religion, whether we share the same beliefs, to then say, nothing in the world can ever separate you from your child and from your child's love. And no matter what your beliefs are, that love goes on forever. Yeah. We have a bunch of questions that unfortunately we're not gonna have time to get to. Um, there's one here though that I think speaks for uh, the experience of a lot of us, uh, which is care, caring for the caregiver. Uh, we have just about a minute or two left. But when you enter a room, when you enter a hospital room and you're dealing obviously with a patient first and foremost, what kind of care or caregiving or a, you know, attention do you give to the caregivers who are in the room as well? Yeah, I'll, um, I mean, the patients at, at MSK are range of uh, ways that they are. Some, some are conversant, some are sitting up, some are walking around, and some are non-conversant, and some are, you know, quite deaf. I mean, one of the, one of the strange parts of being a, a chaplain in a palliative care setting is sort of dropping in out of thin air into someone's life at this incredibly vulnerable and incredibly sad um, moment. That, that the whole family unit is experiencing. And, um, and, and, and so I think, you know, for patients who are not, no longer responsive, the care is all about the family. Um, it's all about the wife or the child or the grandparents or whomever it is who's in the room, um, often multiple generations. Um, you know, it's, it's, I would like to say it's ongoing. Um, I've, I've done several services for patients uh, that I have known at MSK. Um, I speak to them sometimes afterwards, but the reality is is that they go home and there's often their own clergy or religious people or family or whatever whom they are in, are in relationship with. Um, and we have an amazing sort of bereavement service uh, piece of our, of our hospital. I feel lucky to be able to see a patient three or four times. It's often not much more than that. Um, and so it's very intense, very specific, and very, very um, emotional work. And it's, it is not necessarily on, ongoing. Very different than per, parishional parish work as a um, as clergy in an ongoing sort of birth to marriage to death kind of situation where you're ongoing presence in someone's life it ha it's a, there's a different quality of the inter interventions yeah I just say really briefly that you yeah, have it's in my work it's all, it's always more than one person almost um, and that my patient is the whole family system and I'll walk into a room where a family just got a parents just got a world-changing diagnosis and they're reeling from that and the child tells me I'm afraid of the pinches, the shots that I'm going to get and that that's a really valid fear too. And so part of my work is moving through a family system without imposing myself to try to help meet the needs everyone has and those needs are most frequently met by facilitating conversation within the family because the family has knows itself way better than I ever could. And children, even as young as three, have a profound sense of power and responsibility when they're ill, of, no, of seeing how much their illness is impacting their wider family. So allowing these conversations to take place within a family using their own resources um, often brings about uh, levels of healing more than anything that anyone else could import or give to a family. Molly, Stephen, thank you so much for this really incredibly powerful and important conversation. I think we've all learned a lot this morning. Thank you for thank being you. with us. Thank you. Thank you.
Next Sunday at the Forum, we are going to hear from our very own rector, the Right Reverend Dean Wolf, and his wife, Ellen, who will be reflecting on 30 years of ministry. And until then, we'll see you next week. Join us for the 11 o'clock service, live streamed momentarily or right next door. See you next week.